Hello, I'm The Analyst, and I'm here to talk about some of Hollywood's biggest box office flops. Back in the 1960s, a new movement of filmmaking had been formed. Known as the New Hollywood Movement, it encompassed many of the iconic movies of the 60s and 70s that we know, and helped launch a number of high-profile directors such as Woody Allen, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Martin Scorsese, and Francis Ford Coppola. However, this movement couldn't last forever, and it seemed to end with Francis Ford Coppola's passion project, One from the Heart, which cost a staggering $26 million and made just $636,000 at the box office, the film being one to the heart of his career and sending him into bankruptcy. As a result, he would spend the next 15 plus years making films in order to pay off the massive debt he accrued from One from the Heart. And we're here to talk about one of those films today, The Cotton Club. This was a 1984 crime film about gangsters and artists surrounding The Cotton Club, a 1930s Harlem nightclub renowned for its African American performers. Coppola was originally attached to the project as a writer, rewriting Mario Puzo's original script, whom Coppola had previously worked on the Godfather films, rewriting it alongside Pulitzer Prize winning author William Kennedy. The project was originally supposed to be directed by the film's producer, Robert Evans, but he pulled out at the last minute and Coppola took the reins. From here, things started to go wrong, as Coppola's vision of the film caused him to replace much of the crew, constantly rewrite the script. There were around 30 or 40 different scripts written for the film, and had lots of expensive sets built, which soon caused production to fall well behind schedule and elevated the budget from a modest $25 million to the extravagant $58 million. Now, this was in 1980s money, so that's a lot. Among the many financiers involved in the production were Edward and Fred Dormani, casino owners in Vegas, Arab businessman and arms dealer Adnan Khashoggi, and vaudeville promoter Roy Radin. However, Radin would later be murdered in a hit ordered by drug dealer Karen Greenberger who was the one who introduced Raiden to Evans, with the resulting murder case being known as the Cotton Club murder. Evans would be investigated, though he wasn't connected to the murder, according to Greenberger, his alleged lover. The film primarily focuses on Dixie Dwyer, portrayed by Richard Gere with both a questionable mustache and accent, as he seeks to rise up and advance his career, but things go awry when he falls in love with Vera Cicero, portrayed by Diane Link, the girlfriend of mobster Dutch Schultz, who is played by James Remar. Throughout the film, it's fairly clear that Lane and Gear don't have the greatest chemistry, primarily on Lane's part. He's not that you were here, he wants to talk to you. Talk to me? Yeah. Talk, I don't want to talk to him, I got... My family's over here tonight. She earned a Razzie nomination for her performance, though the two would get two more chances together as they'd later have on-screen time in Unfaithful and Nights in Rodanthe in the 2000s. Starting as a performer at the Cotton Club, he would soon enter the film business. Here he comes, J.W., watch him. He's an egg cream. An only man always had good judgment and talent. Right, kid's fantastic. What's the kid's name? Dixie Dwyer. Keep an eye on him. Keep an eye on him. It'll choke you up. Right, fantastic kid. He's coming in now. Unbelievable. Watch him. Watch him. With the assistance of Oni Madden, portrayed by Bob Hoskins. Excuse me. I'm looking. Yeah. That's why he's on fear. It's loyalty, we need. In the role, Hoskins does do a pretty good job with his performance, and he has an okay accent, 
though I have to admit that his character does feel highly reminiscent of Tommy DeVito, also known as Joe Pesci's character in Goodfellas. Hmm. Maybe he inspired much of Pesci's performance. Additionally, Dixie has a brother named Vincent, portrayed by Nicholas Cage. Jesus Christ, kid. What? What happened? Though it's clear that Cage has a terrible accent here that doesn't even sound like him, almost as if he was being dubbed. Of course, this was his early work before he became the over-the-top ham we know him as today. This hers? Tell me! Yeah. How to get burned? How to get burned? I... How to get burned? How to get burned? Oh no! Not the bees! Not the bees! Ah! Oh, my eyes! My eyes! Ah! Ah! Vincent Dwyer is based upon Vincent Mad Dog Coley. who, in his attempt to kill an underling of Dutch Schultz, killed a child and was forced on the run. <laughs> Taking hostage, Frenchie Damon, portrayed by Fred Gwynn. What's this all about? Right-hand man of Madden. Madden sends Dixie to pay the ransom. He only trusts you to carry the money. 50 grand. Cut it. And you can see that Matt really does care for his right hand man. <laughs> and that the Dwyer brothers aren't on good terms. What she's going through. What she's going through? Does everybody hate me? Yeah, you shouldn't have kid. Why you say he didn't do it? He's got the kids dead. And you're gonna take the rap. Eventually, Vincent is killed in a hit orchestrated by Madden, which is accurate to how Kali died in real life. Also, note the scream Vincent has. That sounds like the real Nicolas Cage. <laughs> Meanwhile, we also follow a dancer named Sandman Williams. played by Gregory Hines, as he falls for Lila, a singer. What color are you? My father is colored. And is soon alienates himself from his brother, Cliff. Oh, they ask you, you didn't ask them, huh? Well, I talked to them, yeah. Play. Played by his real-life brother, Maurice. However, as Sandman tries to help Lila, they come across trouble, only to be helped out by Bumpy Rhodes based on real-life gangster Bumpy Johnson, who is portrayed by Lawrence Fishburne, who would play Johnson in 1997's Hoodlum. Eventually, Schultz is eliminated by Madden's men, who retires after a parole violation, you know, I ain't gonna be bossing nothing after next week, Charlie. You're retiring? <laughs> I'm going back to jail. It's just a little parole violation, but it ain't a bad excuse to get out of the wreck. Which, again, happened in real life, and the film ends with Dixie and Vera together, and Sandman performing at the cop club. The Con Club is certainly nice to look at, with stylish art direction and costumes, earning an Oscar nomination for the former, as well as good music and dancing, and actually feels like the 1930s, holding true to history. Unlike in Sean, which bastardized history to hammer in an unnecessary religious message. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. I will. Of course, the acting isn't perfect, and there are some uninteresting parts. But it's well edited, and Oscar nominated for that. Especially with its multiple juxtapositions of violence and dance. Let me rest today. No. 
serving a, a nice contrast of the era, both the light and the violent. The Cotton Club opened on December 14, 1984, and opened with 2.9 million in fifth place behind the second weekend of Beverly Hills Cop, Dune's opening weekend, plus the second frames of City Heat, and 2010, the year we made contact. As it did open in December, it had a large multiplier, holding rather well to make $25.9 million in its entire run. After the theaters take their cut of the gross, Orion would be left with $14.1 million, which leaves most of the film's cost as red ink. Currently, The Cotton Club holds a 75% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes and a 6.5 on IMDb, meaning that it has an okay reception to this day. And the estimated loss on this film is $43.9 million. Thanks for watching, press that like button, and be sure to subscribe.